All right, welcome to Thick as Thieves. I'm Veronica. And I'm Sarah. And we are private investigators who love art. We love it. We love it so much. (laughs) And we get so sad when it gets stolen. Very sad. And then we want to know who did it. And why. Did they get caught? (laughs) Did they get away with it? And then what happened to the art after? (laughs) And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, Sarah, what you got? Today, we have got the story of Spider-Man. Spider-Man? Spider-Man. Of course, Spider-Man stole art. <laughs> yeah, he's he's the, the only art thief that got such a cool little nickname. Which is why I was intrigued by him in the first place. He is a man who stole some art in Paris. Mm. It's originally from Bosnia. And this heist happened in 2010. Not that long ago. Not that long ago. But it took a couple years for him to go to trial, and he was in the media a lot. People kind of went nuts over this guy because he's he's kind of like like a French Jason Statham type character. Mm. He's like this bald, kind of tall guy. I wouldn't necessarily say he's hunky, but he's he's just got a certain look that it kind of looks like he would be in an action movie. Mm. And he's super arrogant, and he's really open about how great of a thief he is and he loves to talk about it so there's he's not hiding anything he's out in the open and really wants people to worship him for his accomplishments yeah <laughs> what he sees as accomplishments so he's got this whole kind of vibe about being a master thief and he really sells it what i want to know is if there was a movie about him who would play him so i can picture him because right now i'm picturing billy corgan <laughs> No. But like a hotter version of him? <laughs> <laughs> Billy Corgan. I think it would be like, I want to say it would be Jason Statham. Okay. Or who's another like bald? John Malkovich? No. Someone okay. who can, climbs, who like scales buildings. Maybe he can. No way. John Malkovich would like look at the building and talk about the building and not ever <laughs> scale it. <laughs> I've seen Malkovich out in public before. Where? It's really weird. I saw him at um in the underwear section of a department <laughs> store. I'm not even kidding. Very fitting. In England. In England. I was with my Shit. mom. She lifted a thong and said, do you like this? And I said, ew, I don't like thongs. I like boy shorts. And then um, this man was shuffling and he had all these bras and he was kind of bumping into us. And then I look up and it's John Malkovich. <laughs> With tons of different bras of different sizes. And I started sweating. I got nervous because I really like him as an actor. (laughs) And then I was like, Mom, 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 we got to go. We got to go. We got to go over there. And then I watched him from a distance for a while. What the hell was he doing with a ton of bras? I don't know. That's why I think he could do anything, you know? So he could scale a building. He could be, um, what's it called? The people that mountain climb on buildings and jump from roof to roof. Parkour. Parkour. I can see him being a parkour person. <laughs> I would love it if that's what he was famous for in the next chapter of his career. Right. If he became a maybe parkour we'll, star. Maybe he'll listen to this and decide to do that. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Back to this guy. Back to Spider-Man. Back to um, Spider-Man, whose real name is Viren Tomic. Mm. So that's his name. He basically, I mean, yeah, he, he kind of would was the type of thief who would descend, you know, on a cable into s- rooms and would crawl up the s- side of a building and go into windows. He did and this in a reg- on a regular basis. Yes, he stole artwork on a regular basis. From museums. Not from museums. I mean, he he did, but it was mostly from rich people's homes. Okay. He basically created a reputation for himself. In um, Paris. In Paris. Yeah. So he was he was really good at this. And it, he's got this whole backstory of, you know, when he was a kid, he would, you know, climb mausoleums and graves in the cemetery that he grew up in. And he just learned. In Paris? No, this was in Bosnia. So he used to climb He used to, like, roam around. in Bosnia? Yeah. Okay. And so there's this, like, Like, as rom- a baby? No, he was, like, a, he, I mean, that would be really creepy. But, yeah. <laughs> um, when he was, like, 10 or so. Mm-hmm. I mean, well, th- they say, he, I mean, he has a narrative for his whole life that there's a really great story in The New Yorker that came out back in January, and they did a whole profile on him. Like, this year? Yes. Oh my god. And it's a it's an amazing this the story is incredible, but the writer 
interviewed him and spent spent some time with him in jail and yeah and or prison kind of you know went through his whole history so that's part of why the story is so interesting to me is because after reading that and learning about kind of how he grew up and his whole mo for stealing art he's just you, it's kind of hard not to fall in love with this guy i think i read a little bit of this a lot like not a long time ago but I feel like, um, you know, how sometimes when you're flipping through something and you read an excerpt of something and then you go on, like there's something vaguely familiar about, a, was this, was the graveyard brought up in the mm -hmm. piece? Yeah. Anyway, continue. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah. So, I mean, basically he grew up as this kind of, you know, run around kid. And then at age 10, he did his first heist. He went to a library and stole two books that were like hundreds of years old. And that was his first, like, big... And I guess that's when he got, like, the taste of it. And mm. just basically didn't stop after that. So he continued to steal things. I have a question. Yes. So was he hanging out with, like, in wealthy circles in Paris? And that's how he had access to these homes? Or was it just he would wander through fancy neighborhoods and then analyze how to break into those houses type thing he was more of a wanderer and they kind of i mean he's kind of like a, a flaneur he's like a he's like a arthur rimbaud poetic like because he's really into art he really actually likes it and wanted to be a painter growing up he wanted to be a painter and he really fell in love with art and would go in museums as a kid of all the heists that i've read about he's one of the only thieves who actually really loved artwork and knew about it and had somewhat of an education about the things that he was stealing, which is part, and we'll get into this later, but it's part of why, what makes this heist so interesting is how it happened and why he stole the particular works that he stole. Okay. Because a lot of it came from the fact that he knows and loves artwork himself. So let's talk about what happened. Mm -hmm. So this is May 20th. It's 2010. So it's around 7 a.m. in Paris early morning springtime probably beautiful out raining birds chirping <laughs> all of that the guards come in to the museum and they're getting ready to open it up and they look and they they find a smashed window and a broken padlock on a gate and this hadn't set off any alarms Interesting. No, it didn't because the security system, and this is at this is at the Paris Museum of Modern Art near the Eiffel Tower, big touristy zone. Um, oh, okay, I know which, <clears throat> the one that's like right on the river. Mm -hmm. Yep. There's so many museums of modern art. There are like four there. But yes. That one, yeah. Yes. And so the security system at this particular museum had been waiting for repairs. It had been completely. It, this portion of it had been down for weeks, and they were waiting on repairs. So he picked a perfect time. How did he? Know. to do this i don't know i don't he think he must that have known he, he might have known but that's not i mean how he did it i don't think he knew i think it just happened to be off and he didn't know crazy because he, he could have done this without if it was on really yes but he would have had like 10 seconds supposed to right yeah so long. so they come in they say they find the smashed window they find the broken padlock and then there are paintings that have been very carefully removed from their frames. Five paintings. And these are really, really, really important paintings to the museum. And so when they... So he cut them out of their frames? He didn't cut them out. Oh, okay. Which is amazing because that's what usually, you know, people will do. They'll just, like, take an X-Acto knife and just slice it out. Right. But he appreciated the artwork enough to actually remove it properly from its frames. So he actually took the canvas and, you know, unraveled it and took it from its frame. Wow. So he did it in a very considerate way, which wow. is sort of surprising. Um, so security system is down. The night that he, the night before when he took the paintings, there were only three guards on duty. So they didn't, they were not doing <laughs> such a great job. They had no idea what happened. He robbed the place at like three in the morning. They didn't find it till 7 a.m. So when they discovered it, I mean, it was the biggest heist since 1990, since the Isabella Gardner Museum heist. There hadn't been something that was this huge, and part of it is because of the paintings that were taken. Mm. Um, so the investigators come in, they see the painting, see the window. All they have is um, CCTV footage of this man in a mask kind of walking away from the building with the paintings. 
And that's like really rolled up under his arm or something. Yes. Yeah. Let's talk about the five paintings that were stolen that morning. Yes. So collectively, they were about $107 million worth of paintings. He stole a Picasso, a Matisse painting, a Modigliani, a Georges Braque, and a Ferdinand Leger. Mm-hmm. Pretty fancy spread. <laughs> Very fancy spread. Major modernist works. Yeah, major ones. Mm-hmm. If you were going to start a museum of modern art, you could start it with those five paintings. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it, they're so perfect. Did he go there intending to steal all of those? Or was this a mission for himself? Or was this a mission for a person to steal a particular piece? So he was on a mission for someone else. Hmm. So as the police would uncover later, he was hired. So he had been doing some art thefts around town, and he had developed kind of a a patron. So there was this guy whose name was Jean-Michel Corvée, and this was a dude in his 50s who really loved artwork, and he would commission Viren to go steal certain paintings. Well, he wouldn't... his statement is that he wouldn't commission them. He would just tell Viren that if he happened to stumble upon a certain artist, that he would be willing to buy it. So that's how he kind of framed oh, it. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So so the one that he wanted from this museum was the Leger painting, and it was still life with a candlestick. Very cubist painting with fauve colors. It's very bright. It was painted in 1922. Okay, that's telling. Yeah. So a really, really beautiful Cubist still life painting. Because I remember digging into my brain of art history info. Leger was, he was like one of the kind of big dudes behind modernist art and especially within the whole Cubist movement. But from what I understand is he broke away from the Cubist movement at a certain point. Like, he kind of was like, I, I'm done with whatever Brock and Picasso are doing. And I'm going to kind of do a return to fauvism in a way. Like, mm-hmm. he was, like, trying to bring back Matisse. And if I'm not mistaken, it was, like, in the 1920s. Mm-hmm. So so this would have been a pivotal, like, moment for him. Yeah. So all the paintings are from the, from the early 20th century. So Picasso's Dove with Green Peas. Okay. Not Green Peas. <laughs> dove with green peas the although vegetable. a dove you know would make me think i know yeah he's trying to allude to a green well when a i listened piece. to a youtube video where they said it i was like dove with green peas um but it's actually <laughs> actually the vegetables and that's from 1910 again classic cubist picasso so that's so there's like several cubist movements and um that Picasso is a part of. And if that one is like 1910-ish, that would be um, analytic cubism. Hmm. Like they, they would be, there's like synthetic cubism. And the reason I remember it is because during that period, he and Brock went to the same town in France to paint side by side, literally next to each other. Ah. Um, so all their paintings from that period look very, very similar. It's hard to tell them apart. It's that kind of um, earthy brown, like very geometric, like things are moving, almost Mm -hmm. like a photograph that's like of someone, of a very slow camera of someone moving in a way. They did very similar paintings. Like the most famous of that time period for Picasso would have been, I think it's one of a guitar player, the guitarist. I think Brock did one too that was of the guitarist. Mm -hmm. So that's what I remember of that of that period. So it, I think it belongs in that grouping. Yeah. Well, the Brock that got stolen in this one is not super similar to Picasso. This one is more of Brock being like, it's it's more fauvist mm. type. It's it's a landscape. What, <clears throat> what year is that done? This is 1906. Okay. Which is so. also the year Cezanne died. Oh, that's, and Cezanne was kind of like a god to him, to Brock. Right. So this is... So is Matisse. So it's kind of like the year, I think it's the year that Picasso, the year before Picasso and Brock started there. And which one, which one is the Brock painting? What's it called? It is called Olive Tree Near Lestock. Okay, I've seen, I know that one because there's like a prominent gutter. What are those gutters called? You know, like a gutter that comes off the Mm -hmm. the roof of a house in it. (laughs) That looks like the prettiest gutter I've ever seen. Aww. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe Viren thought that as well. Right. The Modigliani painting is Woman with a Fan. That's from 1919. His work is the least I know about. He had a painting in one of the museums I worked for. 
a very classic Modigliani. Mm-hmm. I mean, what I think of when I think of Modigliani is a woman with a very long giraffe neck and slopey shoulders and just sort of looking like an awkward swan. Mm-hmm. That's what all of his paintings of women. Right. Look like. This one very much same, similar vein. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a gorgeous painting. An interesting fact about that work is that it was made in 1919 and Modigliani died a year after that. So Modigliani so, died really early. He died when he was 35. Oh, my God. Yeah. So this is painted a year before he died. What did he die of? Tuberculosis. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. I think that was a thing back then. It was. <laughs> <laughs> so he picked the other ones. Like, no one had told him that they... One more. Oh, oh there's another. Oh, sorry. The Matisse. One. Let's just... Oh, while we're talking That's about my favorite. <laughs> So the Matisse that he stole was called Pastoral, and that was a painting from 1906, another Fauvist sort of looking painting. I know that one. It's just, it's a very like, the theme is like the joy of life. It's a uh, countryside. There are people in it. Yeah. What, mm-hmm. what Tomich says about why he took this painting. So as we were saying, only one of them was commissioned. When, yeah. well, I, when I say commissioned, I mean, was basically spoken for. Right. Tomich stole the other four on his own accord <laughs> because the security system was down and he was in there and he was like, oh, I can get more than one. I have a question about this though. Mm-hmm. The security system, the alarms in museums sometimes don't have, they don't make a sound in the museum when they go off. Mm-hmm. They're like alarms that kind of just go off in like security headquarters. <laughs> so I'm wondering why he had so much confidence that none of that was happening while he was taking the time to, he, I guess I'm bringing it back to the theory that he had to know the alarm system was down. Maybe. I, this is my theory. But he actually left the museum and went back through the... Okay. So, that. well, let's talk about how... Let's talk about what happened okay. before, like everything leading up to it. So earlier that month, mm-hmm. so the the heist happened on the 20th. Earlier that month, Tomich is walking near the CN. Yeah, the CN. The Sen? You're my, <laughs> you're my <laughs> language teacher. Okay, so Tomich is walking near the Sen, and he eyes this cubist painting from the window. Now, the windows in this museum, they're kind of low. They're sort of low to the ground. It's not like some high-up window on the perimeter of this museum. They're, you can stand in front of it and sort of see through. Mm. So he sees this cubist painting in the museum, and he's sort of taken with it, and he kind of looks. And as he's looking at this painting... From the outside, he starts looking at the window itself, and he starts thinking, like, that looks familiar. That type of window looks really familiar. And as it turns out, it's the exact same type of window that he had disassembled in a previous theft, like screw for screw, in someone's home from another heist some years ago. I don't remember if it was in a home or if it was another, like, museum, but he knew it. Mm -hmm. He knew that he could take apart that window. So he's thinking, like, this kind of looks similar. So he goes up to the window, and he takes out his pocket knife, and he flicks away some of the paint that's on the screws of the window and realizes, yep, it's the exact same thing. So He does this at night, this little experiment? I think this is during the day. Okay. Um, So the gears start turning. So Mm -hmm. now he's like, okay, this is a window that I know how to deal with. What can I, you know, how can I make this work? So what's funny is he says uh, he realized his luck. (laughs) That to him, it's, he said that he felt like, you know, this was lucky and that his past experiences were like all leading up to this moment. He says this from a a prison cell. (laughs) Yeah. So he's quoted in the New Yorker as saying, I even asked myself if I was not in another dimension at that time. So this was fate for him. <laughs> like, wow. This is my big... Like, this was... This is supposed to happen. Bucket list item. Once it's done, he's good. Yes. Wow. So, yeah. So he was he was really excited about this. So he goes into the museum. He notices the window. He goes in the museum to take a look around. He's like, okay, I see an opportunity here, and I'm going to see if I can make this happen. He goes into the museum... Here's how he knows that the, you're right. He knows that the system is down. So he goes into the museum. I should have, I should have reread all this. It's okay. This. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So he goes into the museum and he notices that all the, mo- all the motion detectors are supposed to flicker from green to red when in, whenever anyone passes by. Mm-hmm. So when they pass by, it flickers so that there, it knows that there's motion. And he noticed as he was walking through that 
several of them got stuck on green. So when he walked by, they didn't flick over to red. So that's how he picked up on the fact that the security system wasn't capturing movement and it wasn't registering that he was in the room. Wow. Hawkeye. Hawkeye. So he's figuring like, okay, I got this window. These security systems aren't working properly. All of this, the stars are aligning to take this artwork from this museum. Yeah. He goes to Corvée, the guy, the the guy who he has, they have a working relationship. And so Corvée is this, he's this, described as this like white haired guy in his 50s. He owned businesses, like a, da- a data company. And he also owned an art gallery. And he had, he had given Viren the list of artists to steal if he ever <laughs> came by them. And it was actually Corvée who started calling him the spider. It later caught on in the media after all this happened, and he became, you know, Spider-Man. But Corvée is the one who was actually calling him the spider. Based on his home break-ins. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so he had done some work for Corvée, and that's kind of how he got his name. And actually, Corvée was telling him, was, like, encouraging him to be in better shape and to eat better and to, like, stay on top of his, like, physical appearance so that he could work, he could pull off these heights better. And, like, so he was kind of like his little coach. I mean, he was he was a coach and then his patron, almost, mm. like, of his of his work. That's awesome. So he told Varen that he would give him $40,000 for the Leger painting. Once Viren was like, here's what I can do. I'm seeing this opportunity. Would you be, would you want anything in this museum if I can take it? So Corvée says, I'll give you 40 grand for hmm. That's not that much. Yeah. So he's like, all right, I'm going for it. I'm going to do it. Hmm. So it took him six nights working on this window. So he started on May 14th and in the middle of the night, so around 3 a.m., for six consecutive nights, he would go to the building and he would work on the window. And so what he would do is he would hang. And if you Google, you can Google a picture of these windows. Like if, if you look at them and you can kind of, it's, it's a really, it's cool to see the window because then you kind of get an image of this. But so at three in the morning, he would go out, he would take this dark cloth and he would hang it over the window so he could stand behind it so that people just kind of either wouldn't notice or they would think that maybe he was just like a normal worker. I don't know what he did, but he hung this really big black cloth over the window, got up under it, and he would basically take the screws out. So, well, let's talk about what he did first. He dabbed the window frame with paint stripping acid, and it would expose the head of the screw. And then... He would apply another solution, which eliminated the rust from the screws since they were very old. And he would remove the screws and then fill the holes with a brown modeling clay that was the exact same color as the window frame. So he would work on each screw, take it out, you know, do do all the solution stuff, take it out, refill it with clay, and then leave. Hmm. So finally, once he got all the screws replaced with clay... He returned again, three in the morning. I don't know how he pulled this off six nights in a row, seven nights considering the, with the break in. So he returned to the site that night. I was like, all right, here we go. It's time. He had on a hooded sweatshirt and two suction cups. So he goes up to the window and with the suction cups, he's able to pull the window out because there's no screws anymore. It's just clay. So oh, cool. Yeah. So he takes the suction cups, pulls the window out, and then there's a lock. There's like a gated uh, gate thing. Uh, what is it? I don't know. It's it's a locked gated thing. Yeah. Uh, he, so he takes some bolt cutters and breaks the lock and goes into the museum and he avoids the few working motion detectors. Somehow he knows them and he knows how to get around them. And then he leaves and he went back off to the banks of the Seine, and he waits for 15 minutes just to see what happens. So window's gone. He goes in, immediately goes out without taking anything, and he goes back to the banks of the river and waits. Nothing happens. That's such a pro move. I know. It's so good. Wow. (laughs) So after 15 minutes, because he wanted to make sure that there wasn't a silent alarm, because that's the thing, you know. Oh, there we go. Right. So he so he goes back. There's no silent alarm, no cops, no nothing. So then he's like, all right, here we go. It's go time. So 
He goes back into the museum, and when he's in there, he says he makes a really great statement at the trial where once he realizes that he, he gets the Leger painting and then once he realizes that the alarms are going to remain silent he decides to press his luck and he says he's he entered a kind of mania like he was really really mesmerized and in the New Yorker he talks about it as if it was someone who was at auction and you get really carried away and you end up spending way more money bidding on something than you ever intended to because it's just like you got to have it. And so he he feels like he went into some kind of <laughs> like delirium state and was basically walking around the museum like, what do I want to be mine? Wow. What else do I want to take? And so he talks about how he decided the ones that he wanted, sort of what he was seeing in these certain paintings. And his reasonings are kind of interesting to me. Like what Like what was his reasoning for the Matisse, besides the fact that Matisse is just the best? Well, the M- Matisse, he said that, he said the little devil playing his flute out of nowhere, as if by magic, as if he were the guardian of his little environment. <laughs> so he was staring at this little devil in this Matisse, bit and just... I, I just imagine him kind of having this moment in this museum where everything is quiet and he can have whatever he wants. And I just picture him like kind of going up to each of these paintings and being like, you know, do I want it? Do I not want it? Why do I want it? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> can we call this episode Spider-Man Seduced by the Little Devil? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so that's why he wanted that one. And the Modigliani... He's quoted as saying, the woman in the picture was so worthy of a living being, ready to dance a tango. It could have almost been reality. So he's looking at her and thinking, like, she just looks so alive. Um, What's amazing is that he was going to still, so he has, so he, he takes those five. And then there's one that he gets really hung up on. And that's another Modigliani painting and this woman with blue eyes. Hmm. And he grapples over whether or not he can take this paint, whether he wants it or not. He said that he was, like, in front of it, and it told him not to. Like, the painting told him not to take it. Like, it, it was, like, he was ha- having... Like, how did the painting say that? It'd say, like, don't, don't do it. I don't know. He said that What's he just... What's his name? Ver- Viren. Viren. It was like, Viren, don't do it, Viren. Yeah, he said that it, the painting was just speaking to him, saying, don't take like me. Like, the woman in it was saying that, yeah. maybe? Yeah. And so when he finally left with all of the paintings, so he gets his loot, he goes back to his car, and he's sitting in this car, and he's thinking about the woman with the blue eyes. And he gets out of his car and starts walking back to the museum. Like, he's done with the eyes, and he's like, okay, no, I'm going back to get it. Like, she is mine. I'm going to get her. Like, he can't he can't get it off That's of his like mind. That's like a gambler move. It, totally. You know? it, exactly. So he starts walking back to the museum to go get her, and then decides against it. Okay. And then walks back to his car, and he's like, no. You know what? I'm not going to chance it. <laughs> Does he end up learning something about, is something revealed about that painting in the aftermath that, like... There was a special alarm connected to it alone. <laughs> no, like that would be built, that would be amazing. But built into the blue eyes. Or something. <laughs> maybe we'll maybe we'll find something out later. But not that not that I know of. It's interesting because on one hand, you know, you think of like his reason for doing it is that he like he has a patron, but also he loves art. So he's he wants these pieces maybe for himself or whatever. But then there comes a moment where it's like if you were stealing an animal, like a a dog from someone's house or something like would you be able to take better care of that work like would he be able to conserve those paintings and take care of them like did that cross his mind or was it just like that initial i want this just to say that i just to, to know what it's like to have it not really like a caring um position you know well what's interesting is that he refers to them as his paintings okay like, because he's still, like, they're his, you know, and he still says that. He said, they'll, they'll always be mine. Because, <laughs> I mean, you know, because he took that, like, they are his paintings now. Like, wow. w- regardless of where they go after this, you know, re- regardless of whether they're returned to the museum or, you know, they are, you know, there's a lot of speculation as to what actually happened. Supposedly, they got thrown in the trash. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, there's, there's still the aftermath of all this stuff. Um, but... He, yeah, he considers those his paintings. Like, his name will always be attached to them. (laughs) That's true. Yeah. So what happened after he took the paintings and put them in his car and drove away into the night, into the early morning? 
Right, into the wee hours of the early morning. Right. And this didn't take that long. So yeah, we're, long? Still, we're still in the three, you know, it's between three and four a.m. So he's got these paintings in his car, and he goes and meets Corvée in a parking garage. I don't know which parking garage, but he meets him in a parking garage. And Corvée seems super nervous. Meanwhile, Viren is falling more and more in love with his paintings. <laughs> So he's taking them and he's like, <laughs> he's getting attached to them. And he's really like, I don't know if I can give these up. Like, I don't know if, like, he's starting to feel the sense of ownership. And I don't know. He's he's falling in love with them in a real like, way. Like really falling in love with them. Yeah. Like he wants them to like be Like he wants his. to have sex with them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it goes that yeah. far. <laughs> but he wants them to be his. He's feeling like they're his little babies. I he think. wants to have dinner with them and <laughs> and sleep next to them and all that. Yeah, yeah. So he ends up going to Corvée's gallery, and Corvée gives him the $40,000 for the Leger painting in a shoebox. <laughs> Very professional. Wow. Um, so hands over the forty k in a shoebox, and Viren... You know what kind of shoes? I don't know. I'm just, like, wondering if it's, like... <laughs> kids yeah <laughs> some like um what are those called new balances <laughs> um yeah i don't i don't know so viren gives over the paintings he gives them all to corvey um to hold basically and he goes to viren goes to his lady friend's house and is she remaining anonymous she is not really anonymous she is a sex worker who he sees and she sometimes gives them some free passes, and they sort of, you know, they're I would not hope like if she's like his girlfriend. <laughs> well, she's not really. Yeah, I wouldn't say a girlfriend, they're but not going I'd say it's not always a paid transaction. Okay, right. So they give each other freebies. <laughs> yeah, there's some freebies thrown in there. It's a little more than a business relationship, but I don't know if she's necessarily his girlfriend. It's like McCabe and Mrs. Miller, but in Paris. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he hides the shoebox of money under a chair, and he's like, "Can I stay here for a while? Like, I need to. I need to be sort of low key, and I need to hide this money here." And she says, "Sure." And he hides there. Does she steal the money? <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, okay. <laughs> She's cool. She's kind of like his ride or die chick. She's there for the, you know. All she, right. She probably skimmed a little bit off the top. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so he gets his money, and I guess we can, I mean, so let's talk about that morning, right? So yeah, what did people he find out. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, he so he hides the money, whatever, and the investigators start their investigation. They think, I mean, like they always do, that this is some highly organized, you know, sophisticated situation. Mm -hmm. um, so the mayor gets on the TV, is obviously really pissed off that this has happened today. And so he tells the police to do everything possible to get the paintings back. Spare no expense, you know, do whatever we can. He says, you know, the five paintings are amongst the most important in the museum's collection. Basically, the investigators think that the thief, based on what he took, has a sophisticated knowledge of the works, or at least a good eye, mm -hmm. you know? So what's funny is that before they caught him, they uh, journalists were kind of analyzing why he would have taken these five and really like create a historical theme to all of these paintings that obviously we know that he was just kind of wandering around saying like I like this one this one this one um but art writers were like there's a reason why it's these yeah five. And do you remember any of the sort of theories that any of them were coming up with I read it but I can't I can't really remember they were basically I mean it was basically the idea that you could start like this person could start a museum of modern art with these five like because of the time period and because mm. of the artists and how it was moving from you know the the fauvism moving into cubism and all of that like and then if you take it and end it with the leger which is the youngest of the group it was done in 1922 right mm -hmm. um it also tells like a story of like pre-cubism cubism and then an artist who was trying to veer away from cubism back into fauvism in a way right which, so you've got yeah. a very interesting curatorial right. <laughs> thesis in these paintings. 
so everyone's kind of theorizing that this is someone who has been essentially commissioned to steal these five for someone who's very sophisticated in the art world who is maybe going to start, I don't know, an underground mu- museum of modern art that you... Oh, my God, that'd be uh, so secret- cool. Yeah, I don't know. I'd go to that. <laughs> right, some little, like, cave, a museum inside mm-hmm. a cave that you have to, like, I don't know, say the magic password. Yeah, like a speakeasy. <laughs> yeah, it's like a speakeasy, but an art museum. Right. Yes. Something we could maybe start one day. Right. So the police definitely think that they've been stolen to order, basically. And people who have been experienced in art thefts are kind of saying that's probably not true because it's rarely the case. You know, like usually art heists are just by kind of idiots who don't really know what they're taking going in, stealing the most valuable thing and getting out and then not knowing what to do with it. Or inside jobs. Yeah, or inside or jobs. have a lot of knowledge of the pieces. Yeah. Investigators are thinking that, like, it could be an international criminal gang that's using the artwork as currency, you mm-hmm. know, so th- that type of thing. That's, that's where they're going. Um, and so it's six months later, and they don't have shit. They've got nothing. They're just coming up with nothing, nothing, nothing. However, the one thing that they do have in six months of investigation, the one that they do have is a little skateboarder named Gorin. <laughs> what? <laughs> and this is the sole witness, <laughs> is this fucking little skateboarder kid who just happened to be skateboarding the banks of the river early in the morning, probably high as hell. I don't know. I'm really stereotyping a skateboarder. That's not fair. <laughs> I'm just imagining I mean, a I'm, teenager. Like, like uh, why is he up at, <clears throat> at like 4 a.m. skateboarding? Right, yeah. <laughs> but... So fucking Gorin tattles to the police that he saw. It's um, kind of unskateboarderly of him. <laughs> I know. So he tells the police that he saw a man, you know, like six two, bald white guy. He describes Viren. He looked like he was working near the window. And so I'm not sure if the skateboarder saw him on one of those six nights that he was working on the clay, you know, replacing the screws with clay, or if it was a night of the heist mm. but regardless he tell he gives a general description to police and basically say like he was kind of working on um this one that's all they got though they just have little Gorin's statement but that led to getting him because now he's behind bars right well not really so Gorin, that was it that like that's the beginning and end of Gorin. Like Basically. he offered this. <laughs> his his last account. name is out there too. I don't remember it, but his last name is out there. So Gorn is forever labeled a snitch, <laughs> and or he was just a really helpful person. Yeah, yeah. Because he's not telling on, on someone he knows. No, it's, it's he's like just telling friends he's being with someone and police. snitching. Yeah, <laughs> but if you just see someone you don't know doing something, right? I'd probably do what Gorn did too. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think any Especially honest help find the art. Totally. Gorin, you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's all they got for that investigation. So then they're actually investigating Viren Tomich for something else entirely. So they got an anonymous tip for another crime, and they start tapping his phone. So in October... Like of, a cell phone? Yes. So in October of 2010, they get a tap for his phone... And Viren mentions the heist. What? On the tap. Who's he talking to? I'm not sure who he's talking to at that point, but they get, he says something about them not catching him. Something that wasn't enough for them to arrest him, but it was enough that they were like, oh shit, this might be our dude. So they start surveilling him. So they get, they get eyeballs on him, start watching him, and he ends up going to the Pompidou and is casing that place. And he's looking at the emergency exits. And they're like, oh boy, okay. And then they are watching him and he goes to the store and he buys two suction cups <laughs> and a, some glue and a pair of gloves. Now, so The windows on that museum are totally different. Right. It's like a really beastly little postmodern structure. But they're picking up on... The hints he's laying down. Yeah. They're like, okay, he might maybe be planning something. Maybe. Right. And then on on December 10th, 2010, they decide to give him a call. Right? So 
They're like, we'll just finally call them. They've been tapping it, tapping his phone on and off, and he's not really saying anything, but they call him, and he doesn't answer. Smart on him. Smart part. Don't answer the cops. So it gets sent to voicemail, and it's like, hey, it's your favorite art thief. Leave a message. Tell me what you want, and I'll go steal it. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> <laughs> so his greeting on his voicemail says... If you want to buy paintings or works of art or exceptional jewelry, do not hesitate to contact me. Among the many paintings, there are five that are extremely expensive. What? Click the fuck. (laughs) (laughs) So that's his greeting on his voicemail. Oh, my God. So they caught him. (laughs) I mean, that's enough evidence, right? Um, Well, no. Actually, they caught him after another armed robbery. Um, but this is how they basically got him for this one. He ends up... So he'd rob people on the street, too? No. Oh. This is part of why France kind of fell in love with him. So over the course of the trial, and as the media started reporting on him, he kind of... I guess he kind of became... Because he didn't hurt anyone, um, and because he really had a love of the artwork, and and he could talk about it in a really passionate way, the French fell for him. They kind of fell in love with him. And so he became like the perfect thief uh, because he didn't, he acted completely without weapons. He didn't hit anyone or strike anyone. He didn't hurt any of the guards. He robbed a poorly supervised museum and not a person. (laughs) Um, He fooled the guards Mm. with no difficulty. You know, he didn't really have to do a whole bunch of stuff. And he chose the works that he took with taste. Okay. And he was also, another thing that kind of made people like him was he was really polite to the judges and all of the people. And it's like, he was kind of like this criminal that people really enjoyed kind of watching. Wow. So did he get a lesser sentence for that reason? Um, no. What's Not for sentence? that reason. You- so he got, so Viren got eight years. For, for that. Yes, he got eight years. Corvée, the orchestrator and the mastermind. So in the courtroom, you've got Viren, who looks like a cat burglar okay. type guy. And then you have Corvée, who's this you know slicked back white hair. He looks He's the type who looks like a cartoonish villain. And then there's the third guy, who we haven't talked about yet, whose name is Jonathan Byrne. And he's this, like, nerdy watchmaker looking guy he kind of looks like a student like a grad student or something and he is he's actually, the one i would date i bet <laughs> definitely he's very much your type um except for would you date someone named jonathan i don't know that'd be too hard <laughs> um I'd be like can i just call you jonathan because it's just how i it. yeah no <laughs> so he is the third player in this game he is the one who actually was holding on to the painting so corvey sold the mo digliani painting to burn I want to call him Jonathan. I'm not going to call him that. Let's his just last call him name. Jonathan. <laughs> he wanted to buy the Modigliani. So Corvée has all five paintings. So this grad student has even more. I mean, I know he's not a grad student, but this nerdy guy has <laughs> even more money than the white-haired guy. No, I don't think like more a, money. But they, but he has lots of money. He has enough money that he wants to buy. You know, because Corvée doesn't want to keep all of them. He just wants to keep the Leger painting that he wanted. Right. So the four other ones, he's like, okay, we'll try and sell these. Like, why did you get this? I didn't. Viren kind of threw that on him. Right. He didn't say he was going to buy those. So now he's got these four paintings that are stolen, that are super hot, that he's like, I got to get rid of these now. What the fuck am I going to do with all of these paintings? Thanks a lot, Viren. I only wanted one. Mm-hmm. So he finds a home for the Modigliani, which is a burn guy. Jonathan. And Jonathan. <laughs> and Jonathan agrees. He's like, okay, you know what? I will hide the others. He owns a gallery, which is, it's like a gallery slash watchmaking joint oh my goodness so he makes watches he's just so hot <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah so he is like okay i will hide your paintings for you behind my armoire of course <laughs> behind his my armoire. armoire my armoire <laughs> um he so he does he smokes a cigarette mm. yes so he hides them behind his armoire and they stay there until <laughs> viren gets caught by the police for this other robbery, they end up finding out that he's connected to the Modern Art Museum heist. And then Jonathan 
destroys all of the paintings. How? Because he's afraid he's going to get caught. Ass. So he says that he threw them in a trash bin outside of his watch shop. That's not even smart. It's, it's not, not even, even smart. Destroying it's them. not even smart. He says that he tossed them. He just says that I, you know what? I tossed them. Nobody him. believes it. Okay. Nobody believes him. Viren especially. So what does what does Viren think? He thinks they're still around. He thinks he just hid them somewhere. But by saying he destroyed them, it got everyone off his back. Well, that's smart. So they're not, you know, theoretically, they won't keep looking for them if they're destroyed. And theoretically, when Viren gets out in eight years, he can have them and they will be his. You think it will work out that way with Jonathan? I don't know. Is Jonathan in prison? Jonathan is in prison. Yeah. So Tomich, Viren Tomich got eight years. Jean-Michel Corvey got seven years, and Jonathan Byrne got six years. So, yeah, I mean, it's a little stair-stepping yeah, sentencing. Yeah, very interesting. <laughs> um, they can all kind of celebrate when they're all out around the same time, you know, yes. after Viren gets out, start a gallery together. <laughs> <laughs> so in the um, New Yorker piece, they kind of say what Viren had to say about his sentence, kind of after the trial and after the trial he said these paintings they are my property these are my works and he was basically saying you know this heist was my masterpiece like it's the thing that he's going to put his name on yeah he can retire now he can hopefully he will in terms of this kind of career path yeah in fact imagine It'd be so easy for him to run any business after this and people would go like he could open a bakery and people would be like, it's the art thief's bakery. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but it really is. It's his I mean, it's his love. So he used to. So when he would take things from apartments, he would go back a lot. So he would return to apartments before he would actually take anything. He would turn he would go back many times without taking anything. And he would look for the most expensive items when he was doing these home robberies. Hmm. And. You know, they there are interviews with the people who he robbed, and they they're kind of like okay with him, which is funny. <laughs> like I don't know, there people just kind of feel like the way that he did things, like he's a real classy. Thief. Yeah, like he's classy. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, there has to be a movie being made about him, and if not, we I have sure to write as hell it. hope so. But we have to write it very American, where we like make fun of names like Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So one of the so one of the apartments that he robbed was this guy. Philip Stark robbed his apartment in 2004 and Stark told wait Stark that sounds like a famous person's name like an architect or something well he's a designer maybe you know who he is I don't know he's he's a very rich famous designer in Paris I don't know I'm familiar with the name well he said quote I never knew anything about my burglar but I've always had respect for his style an admiration for his temerity, and a sort of intimate affection for him after I discovered that he'd practically been living with us in the apartment for a few days, spending his time sawing in to my poor small safety box without even disturbing us. It was very much a gentleman burglar situation. Aww. <laughs> very sweet. Yeah, so it's kind of like... Everything about the story is sweet except the art is gone. Right, yeah. Or not. Or not gone. It might still be around. If you we know where the art know. is, <laughs> please give us a call. <laughs> call us <laughs> on our number that we're and we won't get out. tell anyone. Oh it'll yeah, we won't tell anybody. Yeah, it'll be a secret. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that's the story of our Spider-Man. Very likable. Very likable. Yeah. Very much. Oh, Jonathan, your boy, Jonathan. Yeah. I forgot to My tell boyfriend. you. Your boyfriend, Jonathan, has an art history degree from the Sorbonne. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so he knows. So he's definitely your boyfriend. Yeah. And he was 33 at the time. Oh, 33. So that's 2010? Yeah. So I'm doing a little math real quick. So he's like, <laughs> how old will he be when he gets out of jail? All right. Anyway. Six years. It's not that long. Yeah, not I can wait. Long. I'll start writing him letters yeah. now. It's oh, what, like goodness. a PhD program's length? It's fine. I know. It's like going into a PhD program is like going to jail. Very much so. Yeah. Learn as much, I would think. Oh my god, I, if not more. He's probably getting an extra PhD right now. <laughs> <laughs> I like that story a lot, and I'm just now wondering where that art is. I'm hoping it's not. I mean, I mean, honestly, legit, would a would an art history guy throw those five paintings? Did he have the Leger too? Even though white haired guy wanted it. Yeah, he had all five. Oh, hmm. I think because they got stolen, Corvée was nervous. He didn't. He just didn't want them in his apartment. 
Mm. So Jonathan just agreed to hold them. Bad move, but he yeah. did. And he got really <laughs> nervous. So, you know, when police started to realize what was happening and, you know, Viren coughed up that he had gotten basically commissioned by Corvée, Viren told the police <laughs> what had happened. So, yeah, I think when, when Jonathan felt like they were getting hot on his trail, he was just like, I got to get rid of these. Okay. Supposedly. Don't believe it, though. Mm-mm. I really don't. I don't think someone with an art history degree from a school like that... Some professor is would holding be, on to them. Yes. Yes. That's what I think. Mm-hmm. I don't think they went into the garbage disposal of Paris. No. I really don't. I refuse to believe that. So they will come back. I don't know. Viren might just track them down and live with them. In a weird cabin. In a weird cabin where no one ever finds him again. Yeah. He will be happily ever after with them. Hmm. If that's what happens. Remains to be seen. Remains to be seen. Yeah. (laughs) I like it. All right. So this podcast is brought to you by We Own This Town. (laughs) And our theme song is by the one and only Patrick Dampier. (laughs) And the artwork for the show comes from the talented hand of Saskia Warner. Thanks for listening. And if you haven't had enough of us after all that chatter that we just did, Go follow us on Instagram at Thick as Thieves forever. 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 <laughs> forever. <laughs> All right, bye. <laughs>